This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. More than 120 years of North Carolina aviation all in one place. I'm Jeff Sonier. We'll give you a sneak peek at the planes that made history when they flew, now getting ready for their future on the ground here in Charlotte. Plus, it's a gathering place created specifically for University of South Carolina alumni. Find out why it's drawing people to Charlotte. And we'll explore how a local company uses ice to create magnificent sculptures. Carolina Impact starts right now. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. North Carolina's first in-flight aviation history starts with the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. But that's not where it ends. World War II pilots flew here. Military missiles were built here. Astronauts grew up here. And now Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier and videographer Max Arnold take us behind the scenes at the new Charlotte Museum where North Carolina's aviation past, present, and future come together. Yeah, present day aviation is something you can see and here at the end of this busy Charlotte runway, not too far from the Sullenberger Aviation Museum, where they're also preparing for takeoff. You know, tray tables up, seat backs in their full upright and locked position. Only the Sullenberger takeoff actually feels more like a time machine. The world's fastest plane, the jet-propelled P-80 Shooting Star is revealed by the Army Air Forces. These old newsreels are from 1945 and 1946. Now they will go through battle formation tests. There, there were a lot of them. The, the P-80s are not as common. This was one of the first jet fighters. Matthew Hefner showing us today this early Navy version of the P-80 known as the TV-1. That his crew from Warbird's Restoration has been working on for months here at the Charlotte Airport inside an historic hangar that's even older than the airplane is. Scraping and taping and sanding near the landing gear. Removing decades of baked on paint before polishing this old plane until you can see your reflection in the now shiny silver sheet metal. You gotta get every, all the paint off, get it sanded down, get all the scuffs and scratches over the years as much as possible out to try to make it look good again. Bringing these back to close to original as possible is what, what, we, what we strive for. So the wire wheel helps us get these curved, hard to reach areas, and then you come behind it with the sander uh -huh. to even it out. And it, so what you do. Molly Kenyon is normally a collection specialist with the Sullenberger Aviation Museum, but for now, just hand her the sander and stand back. Every day is a surprise. <laughs> um, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I, I find it extremely rewarding. And luckily we have a good team of workers here who are helping us get it done. And I think it's really special that everyone here working on this plane will have a special tie to this aircraft. At the other end here of what used to be Charlotte's Aviation Museum, pilot Brian Rosenstein already has a special tie to this yellow Stearman training plane from World War II that he's working on. I own one of these um, that I fly regularly. I just uh, flew it yesterday. Um, I do flight instruction with it and teach people how to fly these airplanes. What's it like to fly? It is pure joy because it's open cockpit. It, it kind of connects you with the sensation of flying that you may not get from any other type of airplane. Mm -hmm. Building, uh, assembling, disassembling, restoring, fixing uh, these airplanes for, since I was a teenager. Rosenstein says he still puts 200 hours a year on his plane sometimes with those old World War II pilots coming along for the ride. I had a, a guy who learned in a Stearman and then went on to fly B-17s. He came to fly with me. He was 96 years old and had not flown an airplane since the war and he asked if he could take the stick. And I said, absolutely. And he flew, he flew my airplane just like it, he was 20 years old again. It was amazing. And this is, this is our history. It's yeah. a very rich part of our history. 
Well, it's a lot of fun to get to see an old airplane and, and help to try to preserve it. For former Air Force pilot Gary Lovin, though, this old airplane is more than just a museum exhibit. Well, I was in this particular squadron from 1980 to 1983, and, and I knew Bud Warfield, his name is on the side of the airplane. We flew a lot of different missions in this airplane, mostly air to ground, mm -hmm. air to air combat too. You know you're getting old when all the airplanes you ever flew are in a museum too. <laughs> These are amazing pieces of technology, um, but it's the people that worked on those planes, it's the people that designed those planes, it's the people that flew those planes um, that really bring them, bring them to life. VP of Collections Katie Swearingen gives us a rare close-up look at the main plane attraction here at the new Sullenberger Museum, the not-so-old airplane that everyone wants to see, the U.S. Airways Miracle on the Hudson plane waiting in the wings without its wings for more than a year until the slow move here into this huge new museum hangar on the edge of the airport runway. Where it used to fly between Charlotte and New York before flight 1549's miracle landing instead in the chilly waters off Manhattan. Actually, it's 1529. If we can get it for you, do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. To see it come out of storage and for my team to actually be able to get our hands on it, you have the wow factor of the plane, of course. But Swearingen adds that after the wow of Miracle on the Hudson comes the why. What makes it a special museum story is really the humanity. Um, it is those personal stories from the 155 people that were on that aircraft, but it's also what that story meant to the world. You have a feel-good story where everyone survived. You can put yourself in their shoes. Yeah, like right up in one of those windows is where I was staring out at the engine on the way down. You can feel what they were feeling. That feeling of hope is a wonderful kind of feeling to have. It's a feeling I felt when we were in the life raft and seeing the ferry boats coming. What is their experience 15 years later? What did this event mean to them? Yeah, 2024 is the 15th anniversary of the Miracle on the Hudson. That uh, once in a lifetime landing by Sully Sullenberger. And at the uh, Aviation Museum here in Charlotte named after Sully, well, they're getting ready to remember and to celebrate and maybe to inspire that next generation of North Carolina aviation. Amy? Thank you so much, Jeff. We've got more on what you'll find inside Charlotte's Sullenberger Aviation Museum, including a fly-through tour of what's old and what's new at our website, pbscharlotte.org. Well, have you heard the phrase, Charlotte, South Carolina? That's the nickname used by many University of South Carolina alumni living in the Queen City. There are over 25,000 of them here. Carolina Impact's USC alum Dara Khalid and videographer Marcellus Jones show us how a local bar is not only a Gamecock hub for socializing, but networking and outreach as well. It's a familiar scene for University of South Carolina alumni white rally towels flailing in the air, and the song Sandstorm blasting through the speakers. For many, it reminds them of moments in Columbia, South Carolina like this. Or even this, when they were surrounded by other fans just as excited for a game as they were. At the Horseshoe in Charlotte, that passion lives on. Nothing better just to see all the South Carolina fans gather together in Charlotte here on the Gamecocks. We're all Denver here for one purpose. The moment you step into the bar on Mint Street, it's clear that this is a space created specifically for South Carolina fans. You're immediately greeted with anti-Clemson shirts to remind you of the long-standing rivalry. There's a glowing neon basketball goal with the Gamecock logo scattered all over it, and plenty of koozies, stickers, and towels to go around. It's, it, it's a great atmosphere. There's a lot going on, a lot of Gamecocks, a lot of, um, you know, everyone's willing to participate in the chance, you know, just throw a, a game and someone will inevitably say, Cox. The Horseshoe opened in 2022, named after a central area on the university's campus in Columbia called the Horseshoe. The idea came after Flight CLT closed in 2019 leaving alumni without an official gathering place on game days. I told him because I used to work at the other bar, I will build you guys a bar, just give me a few years, obviously can't help it overnight. So we started looking, 
going around with some real estate agents, seeing what was available. Owner James Corpella isn't a USC alumnus. However, after witnessing the infectious team spirit in Charlotte throughout the years, he became a fan and wanted to make sure alumni not only had a place to watch the games together, but had a place that felt like home. I personally stand up at the front, greet everybody most of the time. It makes me happy when you, you stand there and you hear these people, families that say, oh, we came from an hour and a half away. Oh, we actually came from Columbia because we didn't have tickets to the game. Creating the horseshoe wasn't a process that Corpella did alone. He worked side by side with a man who's been a fan since his very first South Carolina game. At seven years old, I had the opportunity via George Rogers, who won the Heisman Trophy for us, to be on the football field. And when you hear one crowd yell, game, another side yell, Cox, game, Cox. When you hear that chant, if the hair in your arm's not standing up, then you're not human. As a decades-long fan, James Wolfe has continuously shown his love for the Gamecocks. First, as a child attending sporting events, then as a student graduating from the school in 2005, and more recently, serving for the past 15 years as president of the Charlotte chapters of the Gamecock Club and the USC Alumni Association. Like anything in life, you get out of it what you put into it. One of our models is forever to thee. That means being a South Carolina Gamecock is not for four years, it's for a lifetime. With the Horseshoe being the official home for the Charlotte Gamecock Club, the bar is used for charitable events like Christmas with Cocky, networking opportunities that get alumni hired, and it helps fund scholarships. The better the Horseshoe does, the better we do, because a portion of those proceeds will go back to our local scholarship fund, which now over the past 10 years has uh, started from a small amount to now over six figures. The impact of that money can go a long way, especially for students here in the Charlotte area. According to the university, it receives 2,000 applications a year from our local high school students. And in the same way that Charlotte fuels the economic growth of USC by providing students, the favor is returned when alumni move to Charlotte and begin working. Research shows the Queen City is the number three destination for alumni after Columbia and Greenville, South Carolina. We uh, decided to move here, um, found jobs here, and. Hopefully find a house soon. There are some notable alumni living in Charlotte, like Morgan Romano, former Miss USA, and Humpy Wheeler, former president of the Charlotte Motor Speedway. But they're just two people out of the 25,000 plus alumni that call this area home. We both grew up in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and so we knew we wanted to be you know, in a town that was like a little bit bigger. I feel like it's great knowing that we have a lot of other Gamecock fans in town. Yeah! So regardless of what year they graduated, the sport they're watching, or who they're making connections with, USC alumni will always have a piece of South Carolina and the Tar Heel State at the Horseshoe. For Carolina Impact, I'm Dara Khalid. Thank you, Dara. You don't have to be a Gamecock fan to go to the Horseshoe. Everybody's welcome. Well, next up, the 2023 election cycle was a relatively quiet one. The largest area election seeing Charlotte Mayor Vi Lyles re-elected to a fourth term. The 2024 cycle will look decidedly different, with both presidential and gubernatorial elections, which means people will be flocking to the polls. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis joins us now with a look at some of the unsung heroes of Election Day. All right, well, here at PBS Charlotte, we are proud to cover stories across our 13 county region. I've had the privilege of traveling to just about all of those counties over the years to bring you stories of people and places. But for this particular story, I didn't even have to leave this very building because not only does this building serve as your local PBS station, but it doubles as Mecklenburg County Voting Precinct number 46. Her brown Chevy Silverado pulls into the parking lot. A friendly face greets her, helping to carry in supplies. It may be another typical day at PBS Charlotte, but not for these particular guests. Do you have a highlighter in case you see Hava? It's Monday, the day before Election Tuesday. I'm going to slide your table a little bit. And Election Day prep is underway. I think the main thing with the clocks is on that thing. Precinct coordinator Debbie so. Stairs, or Chief Judge as she's officially called, leads her team of roughly 10 people in turning PBS Charlotte's Broadcast Hall of Fame into a voting precinct for the Commonwealth Park neighborhood. So I, I handle the setting up 
there's a lot that needs to be done, from unraveling wires to organizing voter rolls, taping down extension cords, setting up voting machines, and posting signs alerting voters of what they can and can't do, all the way down to the finishing touches, like putting out flags, and of course, what's an election without the I voted stickers? It's work, but it's fun. You usually have to set up all the laptops and all the machines. We have to you know, do a, a test on it to make sure everything runs accurately. The group whips in and out in about 45 minutes, thanks in large part to Debbie, who, let's just say, has done this a time or two. The first election you worked? Ronald Reagan. Yep, that's right, 1984. Ronald Reagan wins re-election, and young Debbie works her very first election. I got a phone call from downtown. Hey, we see you're registered to vote. The person that's doing your job is retiring. We want you. I'm thinking, you know me? I don't know who gave my name. I never found out. And I said, okay. Little did Debbie know that 40 years later, she'd still be doing it. General elections, primaries, every single one. I missed one year because my daughter had a baby and I kept the baby. And then, um, I went right back into it. To know the amount of history that she's seen, the ups, the downs, the in-betweens, the good, the bad, um, the red, the blue, the blue, the red is, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. In November, Debbie will work her ninth presidential election, earning her a fitting title from her team, Madam President. Uh, Madam President. Yes, yes, my dear. I'm like, Madam President, um, can, can you help me out here? Yeah. <laughs> How and when did that start? Oh gosh, it probably started about five years ago. I think it's hilarious. I love it. I, I love it. It just kind of stuck. I, I, you know, she just, she was just in, the lady in charge, you know. So. And it fits well. She, she earned the title. <laughs> the question for Debbie is why? Why do it all these years? Why not let someone else do their civic duty and take over? The answer for Debbie is pretty simple. I love my people. I really do. I, I am so blessed. I mean, I've just got wonderful and a wonderful variety of people. You know, most of them retire, but not all. And they love coming there and being there. They love what they're doing, serving, but they also love seeing our neighbors because we have a great neighborhood. I don't even know if I'd do it this long if it wasn't for her. As with most precincts, poll workers live within the district, which helps create a sense of community pride and camaraderie. Our neighborhood was, it was changing. And so as it changed and you didn't get to know your neighbors as well, this was a great way to do it. We're like a family. We know each other. We've been around each other for years. While most are retirees, Portia Gaines brings youth and diversity to the group and is willing to take a day off from her full-time job to serve. My mom's baby boomer and she, I feel like in, with her generation, they really instilled civic duty and how important it is to vote. And then more specifically, being a person of color, being a black woman, um, how a lot of my ancestors didn't have the ability to, or they had to fight, or it wasn't safe for them to vote when they could. So the fact that I can come into a safe space or work, and people like me see me there, and it makes them more comfortable to come and vote and feel, you know, a familiar face, um, is a big part of why I do it. How's it going today? Good. Election Day Tuesday is a long one for everybody involved. Well, you'll laugh because nobody else gets up this early, but I'm up by three. Because I want to sit down in the morning. I want to have my quiet time without other people. I want to eat my oatmeal. I'm going to walk out that door, not rush, so that way I can just stroll in. The crew arrives at 545. Polls open at 6.30, then it's 13 hours of non-stop voting until 7.30. The team brings lunch and plenty of snacks and cookies to make it through the day. Great, there's your ballot. If you'll take it down there, she'll get you on the machine. Thanks. Thank you. The volunteers do get paid by the county, $100 for the day, which comes out to about eight bucks an hour. You're volunteering and getting a thank you. As for Debbie, she does have a life outside of being Madam President. What was I before I was this? Yeah. Well, I have a BFA, which really probably stands for better find another job because you're <laughs> A lifelong artist specializing in weaving and looming and a little face painting. Yeah, I'm a clown. I was a clown. I haven't had to put on clown makeup since the remake of the movie It, so I need to go and thank the, the producers of that 
because it takes a long time, although I love dressing up as a clown. But, so I still do face painting and make balloons. And um, don't tell your children, but I am Miss Claus a lot, so yeah. Okay, I'm such a huge fan of Debbie and the entire crew of volunteers who come and work here at PBS Charlotte on Election Day. I look forward to seeing them. I also look forward to the entire community coming to visit their public television station on that day. It's a great awareness opportunity and we love being open to service, but, but Debbie, I can't believe she's hitting her 40th year yeah. of volunteering. And my question is, and I've never asked her, how long does she plan on doing this? I know, it's amazing when you think she's been doing this for 40 years since, you know, Reagan's second, you know, inauguration. So, of course, that's the question I had to ask Debbie, of course. Her response, she's not sure how much longer she wants to keep doing this, but she did say that between her team, which she loves, and all the technical advances to the voting system over the years, whether through the county or here at the precinct and all the technological advances, she says things are getting easier all the time, so why not keep doing it? I mean, it's just, you know, if things keep getting easier as opposed to harder, it's like, well, okay, she loves her team, she enjoys it, she's serving her community, and why not keep doing it as long as she's physically able? They always bring cookies, and I've been known to eat some of their cookies <laughs> on that day. They're so great. Jason, thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Finally tonight, we all remember how the pandemic affected our everyday life, the supply chain and the economy. But for some, the pandemic created opportunities. Do you remember cocktail kits to go? Well, one local business that specializes in ice sculpting had to pivot during COVID because the demand for sculptures melted. Artisan ice sculptures and cocktail ice repurposed some of the equipment they had and began creating specialty ice for those kits. Producer Russ Hunsinger takes us inside one of the coolest businesses around to see how those amazing sculptures and craft ice are made. All we do in our business is make ice. Go, go, go. Right now, you're looking somewhere around 19 degrees. Artisan Ice Sculptures and Cocktail Ice is a family-owned company that strives to make the best cocktail ice and ice sculptures in the Carolinas, even all the way around the southeast. This is our two-inch cocktail cube. Cocktail ice is your the larger format ice. Some would call it a custom ice that is made from pure clear crystal blocks that we have here in the shop. Once they are cut down, they're then packaged and shipped to our bars and restaurants. These are monogrammed and logoed. On These bars and restaurants will put them in their specialty cocktail drinks. Our cocktail ice is anywhere from one and three quarters of an inch all the way up to two and a half inches, as well as spheres. About a third of our business is all towards cocktail ice. These are our Collins sticks, and these will go into a tall Collins glass for Lots of summertime drinks. Ice is an ingredient and the flavor profiles do matter. If you've got an ice cube that's been sitting in your freezer next to a bag of french fries, well, your ice is gonna taste like french fries. We use Artisan Ice because they are the best. They uh, have the most perfect ice cubes uh, that are crystal clear and everybody loves to drink beautiful cocktails and the ice is a big part of that. When you put a big, beautiful, perfect ice cube like Artisan does in front of a, a customer, they every single time people look at it and they're like, wow, that is that's perfect. They're like, how do you guys do that? Because nobody can do it, nobody can get it right at home. And so I just tell them that we've got professionals doing it. The ice sculpture side is is our bread and butter. This is where we love our spend our most time is with our ice sculptures. The ice sculptures takes it right back down to our roots. We start out with a 300 pound block of ice. These blocks of ice are made in Kleinbelt ice machines, which take approximately four days to make two blocks of ice. These Kleinbelt machines use a system that freezes the water from the bottom up. We have a pump that sits at the top that moves the water in a circular motion. That circular motion creates a current. That current is bringing all those impurities up towards the top. When I say impurities, I mean your chlorine, the things that would be in your city tap water, as well as your air bubbles. Whether you believe it or not, the ice that comes out of your fridge and the, uh, and the ice maker of your fridge, you know how it's kind of cloudy or white? That's because it's sitting in the tray and nothing's moving that water, so it's just freezing in one piece there. When they're ready, we harvest them and run them through our bandsaw. We store them in our freezer until we're ready to use them. 
when it comes to creating an ice sculpture, it takes lots and lots of craftsmanship. Nathan has been honing in this skill for many years now. Nathan is a master carver who is always willing to try something new. I like to carve animals. Animals really are fun to me. Nature, scenes, anything. Uh, just really, it's, it's all about whatever the most challenge is for the time. For um, some folks wedding, we did a nine foot tall cactus and it was just magnificent. So it's always cool to hear the responses from our customers. Everybody's just always asked, is that real ice? <laughs> Funny enough. The passion is, it's about making other people happy. It's, you know, it's all about, for me, creating a wow factor. When I walk into a building or the bride sees their, their sculpture for the first time, it's a breathtaking moment. And it's all about seeing everybody's happiness and bringing people together. Thank you, Russ. Artisan Ice Sculptures and Cocktail Ice has expanded to 16 bars and restaurants and is planning to grow even more. Artisan Specialty Ice is also available in some retail locations. If you're curious about what these sculptures might cost, the price is based on what the customer has in mind. Sculptures start at around $450 and can go over $10,000. I never cease to be amazed at the interesting people and businesses throughout our region. You may know about some that we don't know about. Please email us details with your ideas to stories at WTVI.org. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. This is a production of PBS Charlotte.